As if nightly Russian missile strikes weren't enough, Kyiv beginning this week with much more in its Monday in tray. First, there's neighboring Slovakia, where the pro-Russian Robert Fitso finished tops in a weekend general election. What kind of coalition will the anti-West left-wing populist form? Then there's a Capitol Hill compromise that prevents a U.S. government shutdown, but at the cost of suspending new funding for Ukraine. What impact? And what's Europe's plan if a small but determined bloc of far-right isolationists in Washington can ride the wave of a return to power of Donald Trump in 2024? After a summer where the front line barely budged in Ukraine, it's clear that it's a war that's set to last. Can Kyiv count on NATO and Europe for what lies ahead? Today in the France 24 debate, we're asking, should Ukraine worry? Joining us from Strasbourg, Katerina Roth uh, Nevedelova, member of the European Parliament from Robert Fitzo's Direction Slovak Social Democracy Party. Thank you for being with us. Good evening from Strasbourg. Also with us is Tomas Simovic. He's in Bratislava, an advisory board member for the Eastern Circles Think Tank. Welcome to the show. Good evening. Pleasure to be here. We welcome back Jacques Rupnik, director of research at the French Political Science Institute, uh, Sciences Po advisor at the time to uh, uh, Czechoslovakia's, uh, che the Czech Republic's rather, uh, first uh, post-Cold uh, War president, uh, Václav Havel. Good to see you. Pleasure to be here. And from Brussels, France 24 correspondent Dave Keating, your latest Substack blog post is entitled An Overdose of Atlanticism Has Put Europeans at Risk. I'll ask you more about that in a moment. How are you? Doing good, Francois. Looking forward to it. The France 24 debate, where you can join the conversation you have on Facebook and Twitter, hashtag F24debate. Um, a united front on display this Monday in Ukraine's capital. EU foreign ministers electing to hang their hats in Kyiv, uh, a show of support for an EU Council meeting that's usually in Brussels. But uh, getting 27 nations to uh, sing from the same hymn sheet, a bit like uh, carting frogs in a wheelbarrow, especially when all it takes is elections in a single member state to perhaps upset the balance. Catherine Viet has more. Populist politician Robert Fitzo is the big winner in Slovakia's legislative elections. With his pro-Moscow Smur party, Fitzo campaigned against the EU, attacking its migration policy. And he vowed to cut off military aid to Ukraine in its fight against Russia, a position he restated during his victory speech. We are not changing our minds. We are ready to provide humanitarian aid and help rebuild the country. But you know our opinion on arming Ukraine. Slovakia and Slovaks have bigger problems than Ukraine. That's all I can say for now. A vocal critic of both the EU and NATO, Fitzo's vision for Slovakia is at odds with his political rival, Michal Szymenska, who favors a pro-European approach. The fact of the matter is that uh, Smer is the winner, and we of course respect that, although we think it's bad news for the country. Despite Fitzo's victory, he lacks an absolute majority in parliament. In order to govern, he will have to form a coalition. The kingmaker will likely be the Hlas or Voice Party, which came in third with 27 seats. It formed in 2020 when a group of Smur lawmakers quit Fitzo's party. Its leader, Peter Pellegrini, hasn't ruled out an alliance, but he did say that two former prime ministers in one government might not work so well. Katerina Roth, uh, Nevedelova, you have the Baltic states, you have Poland, uh, who see Russia's invasion of Ukraine as an existential threat for, their, for themselves. But as you heard in that clip, uh, Robert Fitzo saying uh, Ukraine has bigger, uh, sorry, Slovakia has bigger problems uh, than Ukraine. Do you, do you, what, can you explain to us why you feel differently than the Poles and the Baltic states? First of all, I would like to say that uh, it's very incorrect to use the words that we are pro-Russian or pro-Kremlin or propaganda party or whatever, which you mentioned also in your statements uh, at the beginning of this show. 
because we never uh, supported Russia in this war, or we never did something which could be considered that we are pro-Russian. We are very pragmatic. Uh, we understand for Europe, we have to work with uh, uh, different countries. And uh, of course, we are also very much pro-European. We are pro-Western pro European uh, uh, party, I would say. Uh, Smer Social Democracy is a, a standard social democratic party. But we may have a different opinion on some things. And uh, yes, Slovakia is, uh, is in a very, very problematic time. Uh, we are neighboring Ukraine, which is the part of the problem is the refugees and, uh, and the uh, ongoing war. But the, the biggest issue and biggest problem, which was also the part of the election campaign, was that there is a dramatic change in the social situation of the people in Slovakia. In the last three years of this uh, irresponsible government, which we had three governments in Slovakia, uh, in the last three years, uh, dropped the, uh, the social security standard of the people so dr drastically that from, for example, from the, the state deficit from 0 0.5, uh, three years ago, we yeah, are on so the number seven. You have, you've you've had, had messy, you've had messy issues. politics in, 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 in domestically and, and you've had a caretaker government. I, I understand that. But my, my question is, is Russia's invasion of Ukraine a threat for Slovakia or not at all? We don't discuss this now. What we have to discuss is the stability in the country. And that was the main issue for the campaign. Who can deliver the stability? Who can de deliver the security in general? Why we say that we don't want to send the arms to, to Ukraine and the bullets and everything? It's simply the, the reasoning is that we don't have any of them at, uh, at all in Slovakia because we sent everything what we had. And we also said as the political party that we will support the reconstruction of Ukraine. We will support the economic uh, stability in Ukraine. We will support the humanitarian aid to Ukraine. But we just simply cannot send any guns because we don't have any guns. For, for now, Slovakia is not protected from, uh, from uh, anything because we don't have any uh, drone, we don't have any jet, we don't have anything, any arm in Slovakia currently. So we are protected by our neighbors and by Germany as well. So it's a, it's a very strange uh, situation for a sovereign country. And uh, we say that we are not uh, opposing NATO or any corporation uh, who wants uh, to sell some arms or something like this. But we simply cannot do that because we don't have anything to send there. And the main issue for the people in Slovakia now is really a social stability and security. This is the, the, the very difficult time because after the COVID crisis, uh, we have a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of refugees, we have a war in Ukraine, and there are a lot of other issues. Like, for example, the winter is coming, and this is not the Game of Thrones. This is really the winter is coming. And we have uh, insecurity because people don't know if they can pay for the gas prices. And we have the heating only with the gas. If the majority of the people are heated by, by gas, and we don't simply know if they can pay for this. This is the real everyday situation of every Slovak in, in, uh, in my country. Tom, so Thomas, that, Thomas uh, Simovic, do you agree that uh, uh, with this assessment that uh, what happens beyond the border is clearly not as important as, uh, as, as domestic politics here? Well, it's true that there are definitely very many issues uh, in terms of domestic politics, but uh, you, it also has to be pointed out that uh, the past 30 years have been very beneficial for Slovakia. The, the country has transformed uh, enormously and anything that can threaten the status quo for Slovakia, uh, such as any challenge um, uh, by Russia to uh, gain more influence in, in uh, our region is a threat uh, uh, for Slovakia and, and for Slovaks. And, uh, and on this, I, I, I can't agree with, with MEP. It's not only domestic politics that, important, that is important. We also have to be very clear that uh, uh, an invasion of our neighbor is, is something that should be very worrying to us. Thomas, we, we saw in that report a possible coalition with uh, two other parties, uh, one which is a breakaway social, social democrat as well, but perhaps more pro-EU and the other party more nationalist. Is that a fit that can work? Will they form the next government? Well, uh, in a certain way, that's the replay of the government that uh, governed Slovakia up until 2020. It was also the uh, SNS Slovak National uh, Party there. Uh, they probably can work together, but it's not good news for Slovakia and for Slovaks, uh, not good news for uh, European cooperation. Uh, probably not for Ukraine also. We have to expect uh, very transactional politics by, by Mr. Fico and, and his, his government because basically what, what they do, uh, they, Mr. Fico does what, what is good for Mr. Fico, basically. All right. This, uh, this is very incorrect. This is very incorrect. I have to react on this. 12 years of the government of Smer, social democracy in Slovakia, brought us to the core of the union and Fico was there when we joined the Schengen zone, when we joined the Euro area and all other things. And when there was a discussion about the core, about the European Union and enlargement, everything, we were always on board with this. So 
if you say that we are anti-European or anti-EU or anti-NATO, this is very incorrect because we never said something like this. And this is very, very difficult shortcut. And it's difficult to handle uh, this question because it's, it's so, so wrong. We never did something like this. And we have always supported the membership of the European Union for Slovakia and for NATO. So, yes, there are, we can have a difficult uh, understanding of the situation. We can have a different uh, understanding of the situation. But to say that we would be against the European Union is very incorrect. And that this is a danger for the Union is also very incorrect. This government so, has to be stable. And that's, it has to bring a peace and calm and stability for my country. And that's the most important thing. And we consider as a political party the cooperation inside the European Union one of, as one of the cores for our future policies. And I wouldn't say, and I would in, in my life to say that, uh, that uh, I wouldn't like it that uh, Hlas and SNS and Smer are a danger because this government was already in power several years ago and nothing like this happened. So well, this is very Jack, Let me ask Jack like Nick about this. Uh, um, uh, Robert Fitzo has already been prime minister three times. What's his track record? Well, the track record was, as, as has been said, that he arrived as a populist with a sort of an agenda which could accumulate the nationalist voters who used to be in the 1990s uh, the voters of Vladimir Mechar. This, is, this was the main party in Slovakia, which actually was active in the breakup of Czechoslovakia. So you had that big electoral base. And he provided a soft landing for the post mechar voters. But he also, as has been said, took Slovakia into the core of the European Union. This was a surprise uh, into the Eurozone and all that. And he joined the Social Democratic group in the European Parliament. So people thought that was it. You know, he had basically come away from nationalism to European social democracy. Guess what? He's backtracking on that record. And he's moving back to where he came from. That is from a sort of nationalist populist uh, 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 core uh, which uh, resonates with his electorate in the particular circumstances we are in. I think that what has been uh, uh, worrying domestically, I would say, is his attacks on the media, on the judiciary, on the judges that he attacked really viciously. And I think it would be important to watch the kind of attitude he will have towards uh, uh, the judges, the prosecutors, uh, the media, because they are investigating some of the criminal activities that took place and that, ever, that eventually brought him down uh, uh, a few years ago. So that's one thing. And the second thing is his, uh, uh, his attitude towards the war in Ukraine. We have a meeting of foreign ministers today in Kiev. They display of unity, of European unity, which is very important, of course. Uh, it would be worrying if next to Orban in Hungary, we had a second country, which was basically giving the benefit of the doubt to Vladimir Putin. All right. Among the first to congratulate Fitz on Sunday was indeed Hungary's Viktor Orban. Guess who's back? He tweeted, uh, adding, always good to work together with a patriot. Looking forward to it. May not always be smooth sailing for if it so though does manage to uh, form a government. Let's take a listen. One of the government's first decisions must be a government regulation to restore border controls with Hungary. And yes, that's all there is to it. I can stand by it. It won't be pretty pictures. Force may be needed to solve the migrant problem. Okay, so border checks at the Hungarian border. Dave Keating, not sure that. Uh, uh, Viktor Orban will be delighted with that. Uh, with that. Yeah, that's true. I mean, Brussels has been so worried about this outcome because they're worried about there being an additional country in the council to block aid to Ukraine. Uh, and they would see this as kind of uh, Fizzo and, and Orban working together. But the issue is actually on this one issue, not arming Ukraine, they may agree, but they have had a lot of conflicts in the past, and they are from two different political orientations. Uh, uh, Fizzo is from the left, and Orban is from the right. So Fizzo, as was just mentioned, is still in the center-left SND group at European level. Orban, until recently, his Fidesz party was in the center-right EPP group. Uh, there is still a lot of tension about the ethnic Hungarians in the south of Slovakia. There are issues that those two countries have had a lot of difficulties with and that those two men 
have had a lot of difficulties with. And I think now you're seeing with this uh, threat to, to impose border checks on the Slovak-Hungarian border that not everything is going to be in lockstep between these two men just because they agree on this Ukraine issue. Uh, Katarina Roth, uh, Nevedalova, um, who's going to be Slovakia's biggest ally within the EU come, going forward? It's hard to say. We will work with the European Union in general. And I would like to correct two things which I mentioned. First of all, I respect you, Professor, very much, but none of the attacks on media and judiciary was ever proven because there was none. And uh, I would like to maybe check uh, if you can mention any of them, because this is something which was presented by the media, but it was never any attack on this. And second thing, uh, the Hungarian and Slovak uh, relations, uh, one of the first things which uh, Fico proposed uh, as the possibly future prime minister, because he just got the mandate today afternoon from the president, is that we would like to cooperate again as the Visegrad for. This is very important for our country and for the future of uh, European Union, but also for the future of the region. And of course, naturally, we would like to cooperate with all uh, other three countries. Isn't that uh, Visegrad forum that you describe, the, the, those four uh, Central and East European countries, isn't it kind of dead in the water, what with Poland and Hungary, polar opposites now when it comes to the war in Ukraine? Yeah, that's true. And we would like this to, to start again to cooperate because it's very important for us to have a stronger voice also in the Union. It's not about a simple issue, but it's about the uh, future in general. So when there is some discussion on the European Union, V4 was always working. It's uh, Hungary, Slovakia, Czech Republic and, and Poland together. And uh, why maybe it seems that uh, Orban is a friend is because when Orban was in, in power, and I'm sorry to say because I'm a social democrat and there were the social democratic prime ministers, the relations between Slovakia and, Czech and, and, uh, and Hungary were the best. And uh, it's very incorrect to say that there are tensions on the borders uh, about the uh, minority Hungarians because there are none for, for many years already. And uh, the thing is that we have a very big majority, minority of Hungarians, like 10% of the population consider themselves as ethnic Hungarians, uh, which is a big part of society. So to have a very good cooperation with the Hungarian prime minister in order to protect uh, the rights of these people is, uh, is one of the crucial things for any prime minister of Slovakia. So to have a good cooperation with our neighbors is it's something very basic. And uh, uh, there are other things on which we disagree. For example, now there is the problem with illegal immigration, which is coming mainly from Hungary. So we would like uh, uh, to, to discuss this and to cooperate, like we are now doing with Czech Republic. So we would like to also work on this with Hungary and to, to work together on these issues. And uh, it's not, nobody can uh, nobody can say that uh, it's against some principles, because one, um, last time when I checked, we were a sovereign country, so we can work with uh, whoever we want. Nobody can stop us. So, I mean, uh, this is uh, very important for the future of my country, of course. A March survey from the Bratislava-based uh, Globsec think tank found that uh, among Central and East European nations, the country that most blames Ukraine and the West for uh, the uh, Vladimir Putin's invasion is, in fact, Slovakia. If you look at those, those figures, uh, Jacques Rutnik, 85% uh, of the polls think it's Russia. That's the numbers in blue there. Uh, and only 3% say it's Ukraine at fault. And 4% say it's the West for egging them on. If you add up the 34% plus the 17 for Slovakia, it's almost, uh, I mean, it, it's, it's quite different. Why is it so, why is it like that? And why is it so different between Slovakia and the Czech Republic? Well, I mean, there are historical reasons. Slovakia, uh, I think, has always had the sense of being at the border between East and West. It, it, it's not a country that feels itself historically that it is part of the West. Uh, you, you have uh, thinkers like Mr. Czarnogórski, who was a, who was a prime minister early, early in the 1990s in Slovakia, a Catholic, conservative, etc. And he always thought that Russia was uh, the East had preserved certain true values of spirituality, that the West was corrupt, decadent, too materialistic, etc. So there is in Slovakia a strand a Slavophile legacy of the past, of the 19th century. That is what I've just mentioned, this idea that they are on the border between two worlds. So this is a big difference with, with the Czech situation, which is much more Western-oriented and uh, much more, I think, uh, committed also uh, to the support of Ukraine uh, than Slovakia is today. If you look at the figures here, and if you look at what the Czech government is saying, let's say, on the Ukrainian issue, they are full-heartedly behind Ukraine and they are prepared to give military support to Ukraine. Thomas Simovich, what's the trend when it comes to uh, 
to 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 this uh, these attitudes. So uh, when you when you look at these numbers, you have to consider the fact that there is a lot of Russian disinformation in Slovakia. Uh, these numbers have actually evolved. Uh, at the beginning of the war, uh, the public was a lot more positive towards Ukraine. But ever since the entire dis disinformation scene switched from uh, anti-vaccine uh, 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 COVID disinformation to uh, pro-Russian disinformation. And um, I have to agree that it's true that part of the Slovak population simply um, likes uh, figures that are uh, authoritarian, um, like Mr. Fico, like Mr. Mecha before. Uh, maybe half of this, uh, half, half of the country uh, has this tendency to believe um, uh, in in uh, uh, these ideas. Unfortunately, uh, I know you have to leave us soon, Katerina Roth uh, Nevadilova. But before you do, your reaction to uh, the uh, um, announcement we're getting out of Bratislava with Slovakia accusing Moscow of interfering in the election uh, campaign. Uh, uh, in the build-up to Saturday's vote. Uh, your your reaction to that? Uh, I believe that these elections were democratic and free and nobody was uh, interfering in this. And maybe a short comment on why people are, like, different from other nations. Uh, generally, the population feels that it's very difficult to decide in this problem because we are Slavic and we consider both of the parts of the conflict as our brothers. And it's, it's very difficult and it's uh, a lot of sentiment behind of this. And uh, well, um, that's uh, that's quite a uh, quite a strong uh, feeling in in the people. So they want the war to end. That's the strongest sentiment which is there. It's more uh, a big majority of the people wants this this war to end, and that's why also they open the, their homes for the Ukrainian refugees. And uh, they are like uh, tens of, of thousands of people still residing in Slovakia and working there. Uh, but it's um, it's a very strange and uh, very strong sentiment uh, about this uh, Slavic uh, nature. And I'm very sorry, and I would like to thank you very much for having me here, but I have a speech in the European Parliament plenary in like three minutes, so I really have to All go. Right. Thank you very much for Katarina for Rotha, never deliver. Thank you for joining our conversation. Uh, sorry you're leaving, because I saw Tomas Simovic shaking your head. Just very briefly, why? I think it's completely scandalous to say on air, on the European television, that both uh, Russia and Ukraine are brotherly nations when Russia is clearly bombing uh, uh, women and children and, and killing people. Oh. And coming from Slovakia, it's, it's completely scandalous because we all also have a, uh, uh, an experience with Russian invasion. It was in 1968 when people woke up with, with Russian tanks in their streets. So, so we, we have this experience of being uh, uh, invaded by Russia uh, shortly after there was a, um, a current of freedom in, in Czechoslovakia. So that's one point. The second point is that we also have an experience with appeasement. Uh, so uh, the, yeah, sure. Czechos the, the first uh, version of Czechoslovakia ended in the Munich Agreement, where uh, basically uh, France and, and England uh, um, made a deal with Hitler uh, that that ended the 20 years that were very prosperous for, for Czechoslovakia. So I just wanted to point out these two these two facts, and these things sh should not be said, said uh, on air or on television this way. Katarina Roth, never that, the lover. Uh, very shortly. I believe that we live in a free country and we can say uh, our opinion openly and we are free for speech uh, given by the Constitution. And I, I see that it's your polit political opinion and this is for a long discussion, but I really have to go. But thank you very much for having me. Thanks. Thank you for joining us. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, there's another uh, precinct to be heard from in all this conversation. That's uh, uh, another reason, rather, for the, for the Ukrainians to be worrying. And that is that U.S. government shut down this weekend. Lawmakers had to offer concessions to hardcore Trump supporters. The compromise freezes $6 billion in aid for Ukraine. You can count on our support. We will not walk away. The vast majority of both parties, I'll say it again, Democrats and Republicans, Senate and House, support helping Ukraine and the brutal aggression that is being thrust upon them by Russia. Right, those words of reassurance coming as most Republicans do support uh, continuing aid for Ukraine. However, insurgent pro-Trump Congress, uh, 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 Congress people had the House Speaker uh, uh, get up and basically point fingers at the Senate. 
Senate wanted to do was focus on Ukraine in front of America. I understand our responsibilities, but I'm going to put America first. If there's a moment in time we need to have a discussion about that, we will have a discussion completely about that. Dave Keating did the U.S. Senate in the, the drama that unfolded last week and uh, try to put Ukraine ahead of America? Well, I think that's how a lot of Trump supporters feel, that the, well, it's the whole America first philosophy, right? That any money that's going to Ukraine could instead be spent on in America, on Americans. And that part of the Republican Party, that is really the driving force. So I think, you know, when Joe Biden says a majority of Republicans support giving aid to Ukraine, I'm not quite sure that's correct. That may have been uh, how a majority of votes were cast in that vote in the House and certainly in the Senate. But if you look at the polling that's been done with rank and file Republicans around the country, there is overwhelming opposition to arming U Ukraine and even in the country as a whole, CNN had a poll in August that found that 55% of Americans were against Congress authorizing more, uh, more aid, more arms to Ukraine uh, going forward. So I, I think that I, I think Joe Biden is trying to downplay the extent of the opposition within the U.S. political system because you really have one party, one half well, of the U.S. political system, the where most people are <laughs> opposing. Uh, Jacques Rupnik, earlier you heard uh, Thomas Simovic uh, describe the uh, erosion of support in, in his native Slovakia uh, for Ukraine in its war effort. Uh, that erosion, by the way, in that survey we showed earlier, it's not just Slovakia, it's basically all over. Well, I'm not sure it's all over. I mean, you can feel it in some countries in Eastern Europe, which is an interesting paradox. If you took the situation a year ago, the common wisdom was the East Central Europeans, they are the most committed to the support of Ukraine. West Europeans, you're not so sure how they, if they stay the course. Macron is talking to Putin, the Schultz uh, Chancellor of Germany is uh, hesitant, etc. So that was the image a year ago. Now we have a bit of a reverse. We have Poland blocking military aid for Ukraine because of ag an agricultural issue. You have Hungary, which is giving a benefit of the doubt to Putin. And now we have Slovakia voting and the opinion poll you gave. So we have an interesting reversal of role there. And secondly... Is, have, is it down to disinformation, the way no, Thomas... I, I, I mean, it, it, disinformation can play its part. I'm sure that, that, it, that, that the Russians are trying. But I, that, that's a cop-out to say, that, to, to, to explain everything by disinformation. I'm sure it, it plays a part, but that's not what, uh, what is at stake fundamentally. No, there is a substantial part in Slovak society. Slovak society is divided. If you look at the result of the election, you have the progressive Slovakia, the liberal pro-European party, gets 36% in Bratislava. But it gets, you know, 16% in the rest of the, uh, in the country altogether. The, the, there is a country, there is a rural Slovakia, small town Slovakia, which doesn't feel the same way, doesn't have the same priorities, and voted for Mr. Fitz or other. And so that's one uh, contrast. The second contrast I would point out, given what we have just seen from the American Congress, is that the image again a year ago was the main supporter of Ukraine uh, militarily, politically, etc., is the United States. American president went twice to Poland and, uh, and, and, and to Ukraine. And Europeans, you're not sure how committed, how strong they are. Today, it is the Americans who are suspending the budget of aid to Ukraine, and it is the Europeans that are united full-heartedly. They are all in Kiev, all the ministers of foreign affairs. And you know what? If you look at the figures, yes, in terms of military aid, the Americans come first, 70 billion, that is American first. But if you put together military aid, economic aid and financial and humanitarian aid, the Europeans have double that figure from the United States. So uh, European aid has been very strong, downplayed by the media, downplayed by the common wisdom. Europeans have done twice as much instead of committing money, and not just committing for this year, 
what they've done at this meeting in Kiev, they're committing for the next four years. You know why it's important? America may have another president. And Europeans want to stay the course. All right, because Dave Keating, in that uh, Substack uh, blog post that you, you put up, you pointed to an article that uh, talked uh, about the plan, should Donald Trump uh, return to power, and effectively you said uh, there isn't one. Yeah, I think when you talk to people here in Brussels, people just don't even want to think about it. And it was interesting in that political article that came out last week, the quote that really stood out to me most was an anonymous uh, senior diplomat within the EU said, uh, how do you even prepare for something like that? It struck me as a very odd thing to say because there are very clear and obvious things you would need to do to prepare. It, 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 it's just when it comes to the Ukraine issue, the EU would need to make sure that it can act without the United States to continue supporting Ukraine. Now, there's a lot of doubt whether Europe can, uh, because as was mentioned, yes, the, the EU is, uh, has, has double the funding that the U.S. does overall in terms of aid to Ukraine. But when it comes to military support, the U.S. has not only been providing most of the weapons, but it's providing that coordination role. And that's the key thing you would miss if Europe suddenly Pulled as if the U.S. suddenly pulled out of uh, Europe, if Trump uh, tried to make a, a deal, a peace deal with Putin that gave away vast swathes of Ukrainian territory, it's really unclear what the Europeans could do. But in Dave, response they, to that. They, they put, and unfortunately, Dave, I don't think people here in Brussels or national capitals are thinking about it. Dave, they, they put bells and whistles last Friday on the big announcement that there are seven European nations that are. Uh, pooling uh, their uh, resources when it comes to production and purchase of ammunition for Ukraine. Indeed, it's baby steps because we have these, uh, these ideas for defense union that have been around a long time and they got a big push immediately after the Ukraine invasion for the first time the EU was allowed to spend money on military spending. That's not something that was done before. But these are not the big, bold steps that are probably necessary given the uncertainty coming out of Washington. And I think we've also seen the, the impetus that we really felt in those first two months after the invasion where things were being done here in Brussels uh, in terms of EU unity that were previously thought unthinkable, I think we've seen a real slowing down of that momentum. And it's odd to be seeing that as we're seeing the, the increasing possibility, likelihood, that you will have a second Trump presidency in the United States. Thomas Simovich? Well, uh, I think there is one one interesting parallel uh, between the American situation and, and the elections in Slovakia, and that is um, it's not good for Ukraine if it becomes a hostage to uh, scoring cheap political points. Uh, Mr. Fico, he's pragmatic. He said what was needed to get elected. Uh, now it seems that the Republicans are doing the same. It's, it's very easy to say that uh, we don't want to uh, spend money in Ukraine, uh, and that money should be spent in, in in the U.S. So it's very understandable to to, to the voters, and this is not a good uh, situation when Ukraine becomes hostage to these uh, political games uh, by very cynical politicians, be it in Europe or the U.S. And uh, to to Jacques Rupnik's point, uh, Thomas, that. Uh, uh, there's been kind of a reversal, and Emmanuel Macron, who uh, up until a year ago uh, was still trying to play the go-between between Moscow and Kyiv, now uh, no longer at all mincing his words when it comes to Vladimir Putin. What's changed? Well, my guess is that uh, Emmanuel Macron finally understood uh, what he's dealing with. Um, my impression was that uh, Western European countries that uh, did not have uh, a, such a direct historical experience of dealing with Russia um, as, as Poland or, or the Baltic countries uh, simply thought that the Russians uh, think the way they do and they are interested in cooperation. And uh, finally, Mr. Macron and other politicians uh, found out that uh, that's simply not the case. Jacques Rupnik, uh... When you're at the campus of, uh, of Sciences Po, the discussions with students on, on what's happened these last 18 months, and uh, 
Is there this equivocation? Well, yeah, the Russians are invading Ukraine, but uh, don't forget the Americans invaded Iraq and this sort of thing. Well, you would always have, uh, yeah, and that makes good discussion in a classroom. <laughs> uh, yes, you can do this, but what about that? And I'm sure that this is important not for my students at Sciences Po who uh, uh, like to engage in debates, that's fine, but it's important argument uh, in countries which are now called the Global South. If you're looking at Europeans United today, they are in Kiev supporting Ukraine. America has so far been supportive. I believe that after this four months, uh, whatever uh, a break, they will come back, re-engage. But the main argument that one hears, the type of argument you've just made, you hear in the countries of the so-called global south, in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America, people say, well, you know, this is Russian uh, aggression against, uh, uh, against Ukraine, and this, is, this, is, this may be very bad, and, and we are sorry for that, but what about, uh, you know, uh, American invasion uh, of, uh, of Iraq? And uh, basically, we don't want to take sides in this, uh, not because we approve of that, but because we think that we have other interests to protect. And uh, we have countries such as India, etc., who uh, prefer to stay, uh, stand back and, and try to make the most of it. Most of it means you get cheap energy from Russia, discount price, and you, meantime, engage in a dialogue with Europeans and Americans about cooperation because you have a common problem, and that is China. So, you know, uh, there is a world outside Europe. Europeans are united, and I hope they stay so. But the rest of the world thinks differently. Uh, Dave Keating, uh, it's true that uh, uh, opinions waver about Russia, less so about China. Uh, and again, there's this mix, and we have seen it in this discussion, uh, between uh, national security and identity politics that uh, make it all a little confusing at this point, even though we did see, again, those 27 EU ministers in Kyiv this Monday. Yeah, I mean, I think, as, as the point was made before, it's, a, it's an easy shot, right, to say, oh, we shouldn't be spending money abroad, we should be spending money here on us, whatever the country is, uh, whatever the populist leader is that's saying that. Uh, but of course, the world is more complicated than that, and sometimes spending money abroad is what you need to do to keep your own citizens safe. Um, but I think the big question since the outbreak of the war has been, will fatigue set in amongst the public about supporting Ukraine? Uh, and I think that that public fatigue the, the public appetite for supporting Ukraine has lasted longer than a lot of people expected, but there is some concern now when we're edging toward uh, the, 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 the third year of the war, as we go forward in the next months, are we going to see more and more people getting a little restless, a little cranky, questioning where the money's going, uh, whether or not it's a good uh, amount of money. We're, we're seeing it, uh, the point was made before, just in certain countries, but will that spread? That's a very key thing, I think, that people here in Brussels are watching. And sometimes there's an event that could change things. Uh, Dave, uh, the uh, 27 EU ministers in, in, in Kyiv, uh, Ukraine taking the opportunity uh, to ask for a Black Sea corridor and to help press their case. It's coming after days when uh, Moscow has once again uh, threatened cargo ships, bringing that grain to the global south that Jacques Rutnik was describing, uh, uh, saying that they are uh, fair, legitimate targets. Uh, uh, is the Black Sea going to be uh, where a, a, a lot of this comes to a head once again? I think so, and I think also there are a lot of voices really saying that the EU has dropped the ball here and trying to settle those export issues in the variety of ways, in the variety of corridors, whether it be the land corridors or sea corridors. There was a lot of attention on this, and then it, it seemed to be dropped ahead of uh, the Turkish uh, negotiated Black Sea deal collapsing. And now we're not really hearing what the plan is from the EU. Uh, you know, the two EU countries are bordering the Black Sea. This is an EU issue. It's also a Turkish issue, but we're just not seeing a lot of movement here. And I think a lot of people are getting frustrated that they're not hearing solutions from the EU on this.
Jacques Rutnik, no plan if Trump returns to power, no plan of what to do about the Black Sea? Yeah. Well, I think it's perhaps too much to demand EU, you know, how to fix, uh, how to change Erdogan's mind or how to deal with him or how to influence... But as America. Dave says, Romania and Bulgaria yeah. certainly have a stake. Here. Yeah, they have a stake and, 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 and they have great concerns, including security concerns, as Romania has experienced recently. Yeah, so that, that will be uh, an attempt to win, country, to persuade countries uh, in Africa to tell them Europe is not the problem, Europe is not blocking your grain, it's Putin. <laughs> you are giving the benefit of the doubt to Putin. Well, he's the one who's stopping you. You are screaming to get out uh, French troops out of, uh, I don't know, Mali or now Niger or whatever. Well, <laughs> and you're welcoming Wagner who are massacring people in, in, in Ukraine. You're welcoming the Russian, you're waving Russian flags. Well, they are the ones who are preventing you from getting the grain from Ukraine. So I think that that EU has to get that point across. EU is doing the utmost, but there is a limit of what it can achieve. The, the one thing EU could achieve is to tell the Polish government, listen, you have blocked the border for uh, Ukrainian grain uh, uh, because you think it was unfair competition on your domestic market. That kind of argument should be overruled in context of war because of broader European concerns. Doesn't that all go away October 15th after the elections uh, there? Indeed, this is electoral politics. We, we just had an election in, Slova in, in Slovakia. Guess what? The most important European election coming is the election in Poland. That's a real turning point for Poland, for Central Europe. Are we going to have illiberal governments in Budapest, in Slovakia and in Poland? That would be worrying. And thirdly, uh, it would be worrying for uh, the Europe, the cohesion of, Euro of the European Union, if we have this Eurosceptic government, which uh, thinks that because it made itself indispensable in the support for Ukraine, that it can get away with anything within the European Union. Uh, Tomas Simovic, would you put Poland and, and uh, Hungary in the same league? As, uh, as Slovakia, I ask the question because uh, it, you do have to form a coalition in Bratislava to govern. Yes. Well, superficially, you can see some, uh, some similarities, but, but you have to also appreciate the differences. Uh, so for Hungary, uh, Orban has been in power for a long time and, and the opposition doesn't seem able to... Uh, to uh, get rid of him uh, because he has uh, acquired so so much advantage uh, for for Poland um, uh, I don't think uh, even after the election I would be surprised if, if uh, the Polish support for 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 Ukraine uh, wa uh, wavered and then also in Slovakia you, you have to put things a little bit into in, into the context uh, Mr. Fico did not uh, win because um, the majority of Slovaks are strongly anti-Ukraine. It's simply because the central right government uh, was not uh, very competent and very many people were disappointed and uh, simply were not able to find somebody to, to, to vote for. Uh, if they didn't like the Liberal Party, uh, progressive Slovakia, uh, they, they had trouble uh, finding their voice. Dave Keating, um, you remember all the discussions we had about the fact that uh, Viktor Orban's party was still sitting with the same center-right bloc, the EPP, uh, for, for so long. Are we going to have the same discussion uh, about Robert Fitzo's party among the Social Democrats in, in the European Parliament? For sure we are. I think there were a lot of people when Fitzo re-emerged uh, into the political debate here in Brussels, people were surprised that he was still in the Party of European Socialists. That is the main center-left bloc uh, for parties across Europe. Uh, I think that some people were under the mis uh, mistaken impression that they had already been kicked out or left voluntarily. Now, we did hear from the PES leader today uh, that they're not going to take any action yet. They're going to watch what the government, what if, if uh, uh, it ends up 
forming a government. They're going to watch what they say and they're going to watch what they do and based on that they may expel them from the group. Uh, we had a pretty strong statement from PES saying basically membership in this centrist group requires support for Ukraine. Uh, so it would be interesting then in that instance to see where his MEPs might end up in the next term of the parliament, which starts next year after the European elections in June. There is big concern about a, a far-right bloc, but that could just be a nationalist bloc that could bring in some leftist parties that uh, are ending up starting to have more, more in common with their nationalist uh, conservative uh, colleagues like uh, Orbán's Fidesz. All right, uh, the, the, the ties that bind, something we can talk about in a future discussion. Dave Keating, I want to thank you so much for joining us uh, from Brussels. I want to thank uh, Thomas Simovic in Bratislava. Jacques Rupnik, thank you for being with us here in the France 24 debate.